Well, good morning once again to everybody. As Helene just alluded to, as promised, we are starting a little three-part series here at Calvary on Sunday morning. And, you know, as a pastor, and I think I speak for most pastors when I say this, that one of the most common, if not the most common, question we get from people isn't really concerning some deep doctrine or theological issue. It's something much more basic, such as, how can I know God's will for my life? You know, how do I know what job to take? How do I know what person I'm supposed to marry? How do I know what ministry I'm to be involved in? You know, these are just a few of the many questions that Christians have when it comes to knowing God's will for their lives. The psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 8, he said, I delight to do your will, O God. But of course, before we can do God's will, we first have to know God's will. And guys, that can sometimes be frustrating frustrating and even perplexing at times. It's not always so easy, right? I mean, this is where a lot of us have some problems. We want to do God's will. It's just, you know, coming to know what His will is for our life in a given situation. I think the issue is complicated even more by the confusion among Christians about the will of God. Uh, I know I've heard, maybe you have too, you've heard Christians say that they don't do certain things because God told them not to do it. And then other Christians say, well, you know, you know, some say God told me to do this, and others say the very same thing God told them not to do it, okay? I mean, so, you know, I've, I've heard this like homeschooling, you know, uh, people very committed to homeschooling say, you know, God told me the only way to school a child is to homeschool, and everything else is wrong. And others say, well, God told me to put my kid in public school, so on and so forth, you know, uh, you know, God told me to be a Republican because Democrats are evil. No, no, God told me to be a Democrat because Republicans are evil. So God, I don't know, either God's confused or somebody's not hearing from the Lord on some of these issues. Also, guys, it doesn't help that Christians will often use phrases for knowing the will of God like, I'm searching for God's will. Look, I understand what you're saying, but... When you say, I'm searching for God's will, it almost sounds like you've turned God into a cosmic you know, Easter bunny who has hidden his will for our lives on the earth somewhere as we frantically then run around like children on an Easter egg hunt trying to find God's will while he sits up in heaven yelling down once in a while, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. <laughs> Look, I guarantee you that when it comes to knowing God's will for your life, he is not playing games with you. And yet many Christians have developed games and crazy techniques for discerning the will of God. I'll give you one example. There's what's called the Christian, there are those Christians who use the open window method for discerning God's will. What is that? Well, you put your Bible by an open window and let the breeze just blow the pages. <laughs> then at one point you put your finger down and look at the verse and they say that's how you can know God's will for your life. Well, one man did this and he put his finger down and it fell on Matthew 27 verse 5 which reads Judas went and hanged himself <laughs> it's not very encouraging so he did it again this time his finger fell on Luke 10 37 which says go and do likewise <laughs> oh, well maybe I'll give it a third try which he did and his finger fell on John 13 27 which reads whatsoever you do do it quickly <laughs> Now look, obviously I'm joking. And yet it does get a little bizarre, doesn't it? It gets a little crazy with the way people feel God has led them in discerning His will. In fact, it's so crazy at times, I think many people, because of all the misconceptions and all these weird concepts, the question arises that many, many people start, can I even really know what God's will is for my life? Well, in Ephesians 5.17, we are commanded not to be unwise, but listen, to understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, guys, if God commands us in his word to understand what his will is for our lives, then he will of necessity reveal his will to us if, if we seek it with all of our hearts. Let me, let me just read to you Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. Where God says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. You know, the, one of the, I think the main reason why a lot of Christians don't really find God's will for their life, they're not really looking. There's a lot of Christians that, truth be told, don't really want God's will. They want their own will. They want to do what they want to do. Now, guys, I like to keep things in this series simple. I have a tendency to overcomplicate at times. Uh, you know, we could spend weeks and weeks looking at the subject of knowing the will of God using a kind of a deep theological approach, especially because, as one of our Calvary pastors called me yesterday as I was preparing this message, he had gone on our website and saw that we were doing a series called How Can I Know God's Will for My Life? And he called me and said, Phil, do you realize at this very moment, interesting you're doing this series right now, at this very moment, there are theologians and pastors and professors of Bible colleges and seminaries who are debating this very issue. How we can know God's will for our lives. And he thought maybe I'd like to incorporate some of this into the study. Well, um, here's the problem. A lot of these theologians are obviously very brilliant men and women, but they often make things so complicated that instead of clarifying the issue, they only bring more confusion to an already confusing subject. So again, I would like to just keep things simple. Just keep things simple. By saying that when it comes to God's will for your life, it falls into two categories. First of all, the general or scriptural will of God and secondly, the specific or personal will of God. Now, this morning, for the rest of our time and next week, God willing, I'd like to focus on looking at what the Bible says is God's will for everyone's life in general. And guys, if you go to the scriptures and study all the passages on God's will, uh, you will discover some recurring themes that make up what I'll call as basic or general will for all of our lives. I'll give you the five main ones. First of all, it is God's will that you go to heaven when you die. Number two, it is God's will that your life has meaning and purpose. Number three, it is God's will that you be delivered from destructive behaviors that are destroying your life. Number four, it is God's will that you turn your life completely over to Him to be used for His glory. And number five, it is God's will that you obey all that He has said so He can bless you all that He can. You know, the best way to know the will of God for your life is to first and foremost read the Word of God. Read the Bible. And say to the Lord, Lord, Whatever you have commanded in your word, that I will do by your grace. If you start there, guys, if you read God's word, and you don't just pick and choose what you like to obey and discard the rest, if you read it with a heart that says, Lord, I want to read your word because I want to obey everything you have said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if that's your heart going in, I guarantee you, as you seek with God's grace to obey what He has revealed in His Word in general, well, then He will lead your life in the personal matters much more easily. I mean, why will God lead you in the personal matters of your life if you reject the general things He has specified in His Word for all people? So, the first one we'll look at this morning, we'll only get to the first two, all right? But number one, it is God's will that you go to heaven when you die. Now, at this point, there are some that would say, well, not, not me. It's not God's will that I go to heaven because you don't know the life I've lived or the bad things I've done. No, I can't believe God wants me in heaven when I die. And I know the devil has told you that because maybe you've lived a pretty bad life. But well, here's what the Bible actually says on the subject. You don't have to turn to these. I'll just read you a couple. There's dozens. 
2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting, listen, anyone to perish in hell, but everyone to come to repentance, which means to go to heaven. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I realize for many of you, this is basic stuff. But let me talk to you as if I'm talking to people that don't know the Lord or are new believers, because I'm not going to assume anything. I'm going to just give you the basics, okay? When Paul said to a young pastor named Timothy that God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, the idea behind the statement that God wants all people saved is, listen, he wants all people to be saved from hell. And yes, the Bible absolutely says that hell is real. Jesus Christ talked about hell more than he talked about heaven or even love. Why? Because he didn't want anyone to go there. To come to the knowledge of the truth, God wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth is another way of saying he wants everybody to know the truth of God, which alone can bring them to salvation. We're talking about the gospel now. The gospel, the gospel means good news. The bad news, of course, is that we're all sinners. Adam blew it for all of us. Every one of us born into the human race were born with sin in our soul. Therefore, every one of us was doomed to spend eternity in hell. That's the bad news. The good news is God loved us so much, he didn't want us to go to hell, so he sent his son to die in our place. It's called the gospel, the good news. That if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you won't have to perish in hell, but would have everlasting life. You know, the devil has flooded this world with lies, hasn't he? That promise people heaven, paradise, nirvana, whatever you want to call it, when they die. But Jesus said that the devil is the father of all lies. When he lies, he's speaking his native language. That's all he knows how to do. And when the disciples came to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24 and said, Lord, what are going to be the signs of your second coming in the end of this evil age before the kingdom comes? If you read Matthew 24, which is a discourse about the end times, the times just prior to Christ's return, the first thing Jesus said was, take heed that no one, what? Deceives you. And then he went on to talk about the coming of false prophets, false Christ, who look, have always been but would escalate the closer we got to his return, as the devil would flood the zone, so to speak, with more lies than the world has ever seen. Why? To keep people from the truth by confusing them into thinking there are many roads that lead to God. Many roads. When in fact there is only one way to God. One entrance into heaven, the true heaven, into true paradise, and that is through the truth of God, and I'm capitalizing the word truth, because I'm using it to represent the Lord Jesus Christ who said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father. Nobody gets into heaven uh, apart or except through me. Guys, when it comes to knowing God's will for your life, can I just say this is where it all starts? Basic but essential. When it comes to knowing God's will for your life, this is where it all begins with salvation which is surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Unfortunately, telling people that it's God's will that they be saved from hell <laughs> isn't a very popular message today. And the reason is because it implies the existence of a moral God who has imposed upon mankind a moral standard of right and wrong, in other words, his commandments. And being a moral God, he has no choice but to punish those who go on violating his righteous standard or his commandments. He has no other choice but to send them to hell someday if, listen, if they don't repent and receive Jesus Christ by faith. Now, this is not something modern man living in a secular, tolerant, pluralistic society such as ours wants to hear. But this is where it all starts. Believing in God's Son, 
sent into this world by God the Father to die for your sins and save all of us from the fires of hell. Again, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, everyone, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, how bad your life has been lived, whosoever believes on him will not perish in hell, but will have everlasting life. And, and let me just make one more thing clear before we move on. Salvation isn't something we earn by going to church, lighting candles, keeping commandments, or by observing holy days. It is a gift that we receive by faith. This is something that a lot of people don't realize. I didn't realize it until I read the Bible. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and I believed in God my whole life. I was taught a lot of good things in the Roman Catholic Church. I was also taught a lot of things that weren't so good, such as salvation is, is a combination of believing and working. I challenge you to read Galatians to see how that works out. We are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. If you have true saving faith, it will manifest itself in fruit, right? Good works. But those good works will never get you into heaven. Salvation is a free gift. I'll read you a couple of scriptures on this subject. You know them very well, no doubt. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. It's not a reward for the good things we have done, so no one, no one of us can boast about it. God didn't want us in heaven boasting about how we deserve to be there. We're all fallen sinners. None of us deserve heaven. But because of what Jesus did, God offers it to us as a free gift gift you don't earn a gift you just receive it and say thank you right also paul writing to a young pastor named titus said in titus 3 verse 5 that jesus saved us not because of the righteous things we had done going to church lighting candles praying rosaries helping in the local food pantry you know helping in the local food pantry is not a bad thing it will not get you into heaven though paul says you know the Lord saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy he washed us of our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through his Holy Spirit, through, through what Jesus did, is the idea. So once again, guys, when it comes to knowing God's will for your life, can I just say once again, it all starts with you knowing how much God loves you. How much God loves you. And has provided a way by which when you die, you can spend eternity with him in heaven, which is his heart's desire. To wrap his arms around you in glory and say, I am so blessed and proud that you're here. Not that he's proud in us, but God is saying, you know, I'm, I, this has been my joy. To see you come into my kingdom forever. In other words, it all starts by receiving Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Number two, it is God's will that, you're, uh, it is God's will that your life has meaning and purpose. Number two, it is God's will that your life has meaning and purpose. Now, guys, when I say or when we talk about a person's life having meaning and purpose, understand that it all begins with you knowing and believing that God, underline this word, created you. It all starts with you knowing and believing that God created you on purpose for a purpose, or in other words, you are no accident. You are no accident. Now, the devil has worked very hard over the last 160 years through the teaching of evolution to cause people to believe that there is no God who created us, that we are nothing more than a cosmic accident, and therefore life has no real meaning or purpose. Of course, this is directly opposite to what the Bible says in the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in the in the first verse of the bible we have the basis for a theistic worldview theism is a belief in god a theistic worldview is the belief that everything in the natural realm was created by a supernatural deity we call him the god of the bible yahweh this stands in direct opposition to another very popular worldview in fact guys 
it has become the dominant worldview in the world today. It's called naturalism. The naturalistic worldview, which basically says that in the beginning, listen, they wouldn't put it this way, but this is, where, this is all they have. The naturalistic worldview basically says, in the beginning, nothing produced everything all by itself. Now, they laugh at us because we believe in God and that God created everything. But here's where they're coming from. Well, what do you believe? And again, they wouldn't put it this way, but they believe in the beginning, nothing produced everything all by itself. There was, first, there was nothing, they say, and then a gigantic explosion, a big bang, and everything. Well, what caused the explosion? There was nothing, and you ask them that, they don't know. Well, what caused the explosion? I mean, you say there's nothing, nothing doesn't explode. What caused the explosion? And they, they don't know. They come up with some lame you know, thing. I, I can't remember all that I've heard, but it's ridiculous. Naturalism, guys, is an atheistic worldview that believes that everything in the universe came about by natural processes without any supernatural input. You say, is this uh, popular today? Uh, is it a popular belief today? Listen to what one author said. He said, naturalism has now replaced, listen, Christianity as the main religion of the Western world, and evolution has become naturalism's pr a principal dogma, end quote. Of course, this has had a profound effect on our society as a whole, this teaching. The Bible says in Psalm 8, verse 5, that God made man in his image, right? A little lower than the angels, crowning him with glory and honor. But modern man, for the most part, has rejected the creator and has embraced evolution, which teaches that man evolved a little higher than the apes. Now, think about that. God said in his word, I have created you in my image after my likeness, a little lower than the angels, which implies value, which implies, you know, uh, accountability. We are accountable to the God who created us to obey what he has said, right? We are made a little lower than the angels, made for eternity. Evolutionists come along and say, no, no, there's no God. I mean, it was a big explosion and everything came into existence and then it evolved so that man evolved a little higher than the apes. You don't think this has had a profound, profound effect on our society? There was a time in our nation's history when in our public schools, they were, kids were taught about God. They t were taught the Ten Commandments. And they understood that there was a God who made them, a God that they were honor-bound to obey, that God commanded they keep commandments that he has given in his word, and that there was coming a day of reckoning someday. And so we wanted to live our lives on the earth properly in a way that honored and obeyed God because we were going to have to stand before him one day and give an account. Of course, evolution came along and says, no, that's all wrong. That's all, there's no God. There's a, there's a big explosion. And through mutations and genetic accidents over centuries and centuries, you know, from goo to you, I mean, that's evolution, okay? From goo to you, okay? Primordial goo through, you know, all these mu mu uh, uh, genetic mutations and accidents, and there you are, okay? Let me just say this to you. If we teach our kids that there is no God and they came from animals, does it really shock us when they act like animals? Seriously. The violence in our schools? I mean, the Bible says the reason there is so much evil in the world is because there is no fear of God in people's hearts. Why is there no fear of God in people's hearts? Because they've been told that God isn't real. And if God isn't real, then I don't have to live according to any God's, of God, God's standards. There's no one I'm going to give an account to someday in the day of judgment. Because th these... <laughs> Evolution is amoral. So by rejecting the God of the Bible, who is a moral God, and replacing him with naturalism, 
Man is free to live any way he likes. And again, these two different worldviews, theism and naturalism, inevitably lead to two entirely different ways of looking at and living one's life. Many people who have embraced the naturalistic worldview don't realize the implications and ramifications this has had on our society. Again, if there is no God, if man is just a cosmic accident, again, the result of countless genetic mutations, then there is no purpose or ultimate value to life, and of course, there is no afterlife. This leads to a philosophy of life that is nihilistic and hedonistic, the motto of which being, let's eat, drink, and be merry, because when we die, that's all there is. But fortunately, that isn't true. There is a God who created everything and everyone. In fact, guys, the Bible says that not only are we not an accident, we are actually God's masterpiece. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us for a purpose, so we can do all the good works he planned for our lives even before we were born. And so once again, God created you on purpose for a purpose, and he has been preparing you for that work even before you were born. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the very thing Paul the Apostle was talking about in Galatians 1. When he was giving his testimony to the Galatians. And at one point, he said how it pleased God, and I'm quoting Paul now, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Paul is saying that God called him into ministry even before he was born. How? How? Because he allowed Paul to be born from the womb. He allowed Paul to be born into a certain family in a certain place, which would prepare him for the ministry God would eventually call him into. And guys, that's the same with all of us. God has been preparing all of us for his purpose, even from the womb. You, again, are no accident. I mean, who you would be, your race and gender. Where you would be born, the family and economic status you would be born into, the talents and abilities you would be born with, all of these were God's way of preparing you and me for the purpose he had for our lives. And ever since you were born, God has been further preparing you through the experiences of your life, listen, both good and bad. He has been preparing you for this work, shaping and molding you into who you are today. Look, God has your future all mapped out and designed. You talk about designer children. That's a bad thing. When you talk about genetically altered children, but people pick certain, we don't, that's a bad thing. We don't play God. We don't design children. Let God do that. When you're talking about children of God, we are the ultimate designer children because God has made us a certain way. God, God has done, he, 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 the fact that we were born into a certain family at a certain time in history, in a certain location, and all the things that we came across in our life that have shaped us and molded us into the person we are today. Can I say something? God has got a ministry and a plan for your life. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to bow to God's will. You can do your own thing. Many are. But let me say this. If God has uniquely designed you for a specific ministry, a ministry that I'm convinced that nobody else could really fulfill like you could fulfill it because you are absolutely designed by God for that work. Well, if you refuse to accept God's will, if you refuse to submit to his plan for your life, the purposes which he has ordained for you before the foundation of the world, you can do that, but you will miss out on everything God has planned for your life. You will enjoy some things in this life, doing your own thing, but you'll never know the fullness of all that God would have had for you had you submitted your life to Jesus Christ and basically, like Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, use me. It's the only life, life worth living. I'll say this. A life without purpose is a life without meaning. And a life without meaning 
is a life that's not worth living. To drive this home, let me read you just a little um, article I came across. I thought this was very interesting. It does speak to the point this morning of what we're saying. Uh, it goes like this, and I quote, During the Second World War, a group of Allied prisoners were sent to a German concentration camp. While they were there, the Nazis made them move a large pile of rocks from one end of the camp to the other. This went on day after day, week after week. They would no sooner finish moving the pile of rocks from one location to the next that they would have to move them back to where they started. And as I said, this went on for many days. However, after a few weeks of this, the prisoners began to experience an overwhelming sense of depression that increased day by day until something incredible began to happen. Some of the men charged the guards knowing that they would be gunned down. As time went on, other prisoners followed, choosing rather to die than to go on moving this pile of rocks back and forth endlessly from one place to the other. After the war, psychologists learning about this phenomenon interviewed the remaining prisoners, and they concluded that the reason those men committed guard-assisted suicide was because they had lost a sense of purpose, and without a true sense of purpose for existing, life becomes meaningless and unbearable to endure, often resulting in increased anxiety, depression, and suicide. Whereas those who maintained a sense of uh, purpose, whether it was to stay alive for their families back home, or because they had a strong faith in God and believed that he had a purpose in the experience for them, they were able to cope with the situation and survive, end quote. Folks, we absolutely need a sense of purpose to survive. Without it, life becomes a meaningless, mind-numbing exercise in futility and despair. But the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, that God has put eternity in our hearts. In other words, God has put into the heart of man a sense that we exist for more than just this life. I mean, animals exist just for this life. Animals don't think they have a higher purpose. They're two-dimensional creatures. They have a body and a consciousness. They live pretty much to satisfy the body appetites, eat, drink, sleep, procreate. That's an animal's life. We have been made in the image of God. We are a threefold being, body, soul, and spirit. The spirit is what connects us to God. If you're born of the spirit, born again, saved. But I think even unbelievers have a sense that because God has put eternity in all people's hearts. That they have a sense that we exist for more than just this life. That there's an ultimate purpose in life beyond simply surviving or living to make money or to buy more and more things and experience more and more pleasure. You know, I know there are a lot of people in this world who have convinced themselves that the main purpose in life is to be successful, to make a lot of money, to buy a lot of things. And that works with some people for the rest of their life. Some people are so shallow, so materialistic, that actually they can survive on that. They, they don't really care about anything other than what's in front of them, what they can buy, what they can see, what they can experience. They're completely materialistic. And so for some folks, that's okay. They have no sense of a higher purpose. They don't want a higher purpose. But I think for most people who tell themselves that life's main purpose is to be successful and to make a lot of money, there often comes a time in these folks' lives when they just can't kid them. They've got the big house. They got the nice cars. They have the big bank account. They go on the luxury vacations. They have the finest things money can buy. The, you know, the, the what is it, a 100-inch movie screen now you can have in your home or whatever. They've got all that money can buy. But there comes a point like Solomon experienced. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon was the richest guy in the face of the earth. He had everything money could buy. And yet, as he writes in Ecclesiastes, his life was empty and meaningless and frustrating until he finally figured out something his dad had told him when he first became king. 
Solomon, if you will love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, if you will pursue him, if you will honor him, if you will obey him, he will be found by you. He'll be close to you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. Solomon started out good. Initially, he was a, a good young king. He loved God, tried to honor him, but eventually, somewhere along the line, he became restless. He began to think, well, you know what? Maybe God doesn't hold everything in life that is valuable. Maybe it's God plus the things of the world. You know anybody like that? Who's a Christian but says, you know, I don't think it's just God. I think it's God plus success and money and whatever else. So Solomon set down, set down that road to experience what he was missing, quote unquote, in the world. You can read the book of Ecclesiastes. How he pursued everything you could think of to find happiness and fulfillment. Everything from materialism, to sexual pleasure, to education, to building great works of monuments to himself. I mean, everything you can think of that anyone would try to invest their life in to give them some kind of sense of purpose and fulfillment, Solomon tried. And after every one of these pursuits, he, it ends with the words, but I found it was all emptiness and vanity and grasping for the wind. And it wasn't until he came to the end of his life where he realized, you know what, I should have listened to my dad. My dad had it going on. My dad was a man who had a lot of material things, but he never let it get to him. David said, the one thing I've desired that I might seek after is to spend my life in the presence of God. That's all I want. He did come back to the Lord. Solomon, did you read about that? At the end of Ecclesiastes. And says to all the young people, don't make the mistake I made. I'm supposed to be a wise guy. I was a fool. Pursuing everything this world has, but nothing can satisfy. You pursue God. You love God. You serve him with all your heart. You obey all that he has said. You will have a fulfilled, purposeful life. Some people don't realize this, though, right? Or they come to a place where they have everything, but they realize they have nothing. There's, their life has no real meaning. And God uses it oftentimes to touch them, doesn't he? But before they are touched by the Holy Spirit, what happens is they become like those prisoners in, in that Nazi concentration camp. When they realize their life has no real purpose or meaning, they become depressed, they despair of life, and even thoughts of suicide begin to sink in. At that point, they're at a critical juncture in their life. Either they are going to end their life, or they're going to come to Christ and find life. Jesus who said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Or, as the New Living Translation puts it, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. God made us on purpose for a purpose. You'll never know meaning or happiness in life until you are fulfilling the purpose for which you were created, and that is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Point number one, right? It's God's will that you go to heaven when you die. To do that, you have to receive Christ right now as your Lord and Savior because he loves you so much. But guys, God doesn't just want you to go to heaven when you die. He wants you to have purpose and meaning to life right now while you live. And that's number two, right? God wants your life to have meaning and purpose, and that can only happen, A, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, and B, you say, Lord, I want to do all that you have said. You have made me, you have prepared me, you have equipped me for such a time as this. Show me what ministry that you have for me that I might begin to fulfill the purpose for which I have been created. So next week, uh, God willing, if I'm up to it after the surgery, um, we will continue looking at point number one, looking at God's general or scriptural will for our lives. And may God give us grace to uh, understand what the will of the Lord is. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word gives us great hope and comfort 
by first of all telling us that even though we were dead in trespasses and sins, we were born lost and doomed to spend eternity in hell. Yet you loved us so much you didn't want us to go to hell. So you sent your son to die for us. And if we will receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will not only have forgiveness of sins, we will not only not have to go to hell, we will spend eternity with you in heaven, but we will have purpose on this earth. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We ask you to keep blessing these studies, this series for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, we like to give an invitation to anyone here. Maybe you're new. Okay. And uh, this is you're just hearing a lot of this for the first time. We want to give you an invitation to come out of prayer after service so we can pray with you to receive Christ if you want to do that. Or at least if you have questions, we'll try to answer them as to what it means to be a Christian. And if you need a Bible, we'll give you one. And the rest of you guys, may God fill you with His Spirit this week, and may He use you for His glory in any way. I mean, the ways that God can use us are just innumerable. Be open to how God might want to use you this week to touch somebody else for His glory. God bless you guys. Have a great week.